All right, Assalamualaikum everyone. We're gonna get started, inshallah. Um, welcome everyone, Jazakallah Khair for joining on this conversation. I know it's a late uh, evening, um, but hopefully we'll have some good conversation going. Um, I'm Dr. Medea Tassin. I'm a research director with the Family and Youth Institute. Um, I'll inshallah kind of be moderating and speaking through today's conversation, but we really just want to make this a very you know laid back conversation. So we'll just give you some information, but then leave enough space um, and time for question and answer, inshallah. So uh, before I start, just to introduce you to everybody, um, like I said, I'm a researcher at the FYI. The FYI is a research-based um, organization. Our goal is really to do the research um, and to better understand how Muslim youth and families thrive, but then to take that research and to really disseminate it and translate it into resources um, that get out to you guys and help you um, you know, tackle the solutions that you're facing and really strive as healthy individuals, inshallah. Um, and so we'll talk about some of those resources later on today. Um, the plan for today really is to just have a conversation um, with some of the other speakers on board. So there's, inshallah, we'll hear from young Muslims who are one of our collaborators on this project. Um, and then we'll also hear from um, Sheikh Omar Hussein from Yakin Institute. Um, basically what happened is, you know, around 2018, we started getting a lot of requests from some of the communities that we go out and do workshops at, um, from just people that we know in our networks about kind of a struggle of pornography in the Muslim community and people looking for resources and not being able to, you know, figure out where to go to get from help, you know, not even talking about the shame and stigma that comes with this, you know, people not wanting to say that this is an issue, all of that. So, and around that time, Nasiha Mental Health had launched a survey to kind of see what's going on in this community, in our community. Is this even a problem? You know, what does it look like? Um, and around that, you know, a little bit after that, young Muslims launched their survey um, and reached out to Sheikh Omar Hussein from Yakin Institute, as well as the FYI to kind of analyze the data. So we, we analyzed the data, we did a needs assessment to see what does this look like in our community? Um, and what are the resources people are looking for? Um, and then we converted that into a resource that I'll share with you later on um, at the end of today's live, inshallah. So today we'll kind of just talk through what is the data showing us? What does this problem look like? Sheikh Omar will kind of talk about the clinical side of things. You know, what is the addiction piece of it look like? Um, and then we'll wrap up inshallah with question and answer. The one thing I just wanted to make sure was clear that everybody kind of understands is today's conversation will be about pornography in general. So just you know, people who watch pornography, but it might not be what is considered addicted to it. Um, and then we'll have a piece of today's talk that will kind of go into the addiction piece as well. So there is a difference between kind of just consuming pornography, but not being addicted to it versus those who are addicted to it and struggling with it and looking for resources. So I just want us all to kind of be on the same page about there is that distinction and it's important to make sure you have that in mind, um, you know, as we talk about, the, the data as well as the resources that are available. So inshallah, I wanna hand it over to young Muslims. Um, Brother Danyal will be talking to us today, inshallah. Um, Brother Young Muslims, if you're not aware, is a national organization serving young Muslims across the country. Um, Brother Danyal is, so I'll just give you a quick intro to him. Um, his name is Daniel Farouk. He lives in North Brunswick, New Jersey. He joined Young Muslims um, in 2011, and he is a national coordinator since uh, 2019. He um, has worked with thousands of youth and personally mentored them um, from all across the country. He has a bachelor's in resource management and information technology, um, but he's currently working on a master's program on nonprofit management. So I'd love for him to kind of talk about how did this survey that Young Muslims Conduct come about? Um, and you know, what was he kind of seeing on the ground? So Danielle, I'll hand it over to you. <clears throat> I think we may be having technical difficulties and <laughs> we'll give it a minute and see what's going on. Yeah, so I think he's um, joining soon, inshallah. We're just figuring out um, why it's not working at this particular moment. Okay, no problem. Um, 
I'll just take this as a quick minute just to say if you have any questions, like I said, we left um, intentionally left time at the end for question and answer. So please pop them in the question box. Um, if you've seen the Google survey, go ahead and um, check that out. Um, you can put them there. It's all confidential. None of these questions are going anywhere. Um, you know, your privacy is totally protected. Um, so let's see. Okay, um, just in the interest of time, I just because I want to make sure you guys all have, you know, time to get your questions answered. Um, and to have that discussion, I'll move along. And if um, Danielle is able to get on, we'll get him on. Um, and, you know, kind of have him talk about the young Muslim side of things. So I was hoping he would introduce kind of the survey because the survey that the FYI conducted and needs assessment on and kind of did some preliminary findings comes from young Muslims. Um, so I'll let him kind of talk about where that came into play. I just wanted to show, share some of the findings with you all um, to show that, you know, we can think that this doesn't exist all we want. But that's just not reality. And so do we have numbers that can kind of tell us what does this really look like? Um, so Young Muslims launched the survey and I'll let, like I said, Danielle talk a little bit more about that. But um, one of the things I just wanted to make sure is clear, the needs assessment that I'm talking about um, is just a fancy way of saying, you know, what is what is the community need? What's going on? So the FYI, um, usually for all of our resources, we kind of interview experts in the field, we do a survey to see what's going on. So the findings that I want to present today are based on that. Um, they, you can find them on our website at the FYI.org. Um, it's called Porn Research Preliminary Findings. We'll share the link in the chat as well. And so you guys, you know, can have that to access. It really goes into a lot more of what I'll say. I'm just going to say very, very quick snippets for you guys. Um, just so we can make sure we keep moving along. So before I go into the findings, just one thing to keep in mind. Again, these are very, very preliminary. Um, without getting all researchy, what that basically just means is it's a small sample size, you know, which means it's not representative of all of the Muslims in America. The ethnicity is um, very limited primarily to South Asians and a smaller population of Arabs. So the findings cannot, you know, we can't say that this is what all American Muslims are doing, all American Muslim youth. So I just want you guys to just keep that in mind. This is just a small window. It's just a snapshot to say, this is a problem. It is happening. People are struggling with it. What do we need to do more? So just keep that in mind as I kind of go over some of the very, very, like I said, very snapshot of the findings, very quick, um, brief look at it. So there was about 350 Muslim youth who answered the survey. Um, and of that, you know, after we cleaned up the data, took out kind of incorrect responses, things like that, we have 337 youth that left, that remained. Of that, um, when we asked the question of, you know, do young Muslims watch porn? The response was that about 59% of young Muslims do watch porn. Again, remember the distinction I made before about addiction versus just consuming. This is just consuming. We're just talking about washing it at whatever level. Um, when you dig into the data a little bit to see how, how often are they watching it, right? Um, their responses um, show that majority of the youth who responded yes to watching porn watch it um, roughly about monthly or, and or weekly. There's a smaller subset that watch it daily, um, about 16%. But the majority did say that they watch it either monthly or weekly. Um, what's really interesting is when you think about boys, uh, females versus males or young men and young women who responded. So the young, uh, you know, there's a big mis misconception, not just amongst the Muslim American community, but even all communities across the board that pornography is something that just is an issue that males struggle with or is just prevalent for men. Um, 
all, again, although the data are just preliminary, the gender differences that we have are very interesting. What that basically just means is, yes, the majority of the men in our sample responded to watching pornography. When you look at the women that were in our sample, a third of the women, so to men, but just the women, a third of the women who were completed this, who did complete the survey, said that they do watch pornography. So when you're just looking at women compared to themselves, they still are engaging in this behavior. It is still something that's happening amongst women as well. So that's something that we have to keep in mind and figure out, you know, what's going on and how we can address it for both men and women when we think about resources, when we think about support and programming. Um, and then there was questions about sort of why do young people watch pornography? You know, what's kind of leading them to engage in that behavior? And um, basically of all the different kind of questions on there, you guys can check out the findings online for more details. So I just, just very quickly wanted to share that the main thing that the findings show is that people are watching pornography to either soothe themselves when they're feeling bored, um, to process some negative feelings like anger or frustration. Um, and then to a smaller extent, they um, watch it to forget about the worries of daily life. So not as much to what's really interesting is not it doesn't have to do with loneliness so far again just preliminary findings it's not that's not a big piece of it and then the most interesting piece to me as a researcher at an organization was when they you know youth were asked who can you kind of turn to for support um does the, what is the muslim community doing the majority of muslim youth stated that they cannot turn they cannot have conversations about pornography with their families you know big surprise <laughs> i think all of us on this you know, live know that, um, but the data supports it. Um, so about 60% of Muslim youth thought that they could not turn to their families for to talk to have conversations about their struggles with pornography. Um, and then uh, when we ask about the Muslim community, again, the same thing, the majority of them do not think that the Muslim community is adequately addressing or supporting people who are struggling with this issue. So big picture, what do these findings tell us? They tell us this is a problem that's happening in our community. We are struggling with it. It's a problem that's pre prevalent for men and women, and we don't know where to turn for support. Um, and so, you know, we, it's, it's, it's high time we talk about it, and it's high time we present some resources to support everybody going through it. So that's just, again, very, very preliminary findings. We still need to dig into it a lot more, and the FYI has some research studies coming up to really get to the heart of it and to really talk about a sample that's representative of the entire country um, and all Muslims from lots of different ethnicities. But at least it's just a snapshot to really break down some of the stigmas that we all face thinking this doesn't happen in our community and it's not something that's being um, you know, supported and dealt with. So I think, um, is that Danielle I see on there? Yes. Yeah, probably again. I like my song. So what we'll do is I'll we'll backtrack a little bit. I already went into the findings, but then y'all, if you could just share kind of, you know, what were you seeing on the ground that really led you guys as an organization to take on, you know, like the stigmatized issue that most people don't really want to talk about. Yeah, no problem. Uh, I've been following. I was trying to get onto my computer, and I, I guess that's not possible for me. But I'm right. uh, just on the fair. Glad you're here. Um, so. <laughs> To really uh, talk about this, I think um, I got to backtrack just a little bit into why, um, you know, where Young Muslims is even coming from. Uh, so we're, um, as was mentioned um, at the beginning, the largest national youth organization in the country. And we got that way from the early 90s. So it's been nearly 30 years. Um, but one thing that we kind of found, uh, we began taking on projects like these um, a couple of years ago, maybe 2019 when I started off. Um, in this new role. Um, but one of the things we realized is that if we have that sort of reach, if we are the largest or whatever, we're among the largest national youth organizations, we got to start really diving deeper. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of members, alhamdulillah, you know, a lot of thousands come to YM every week, but thousands is a needle in the haystack of all the Muslim youth that are out there, right? And so what we felt very strongly about is that we need to take it a step up. We need to start looking at the real problems that are going on in the Muslim youth and work on actually properly addressing them. So where this particular topic comes in, and it's part of our larger campaign of 
Muslim youth issues that we're trying to cover different issues um, that we've been noticing. So the first one we did was judgment stigma, but this is the, the second one that we did. And the reason why this came about was actually right around the time the pandemic began is when we started off on researching this. Um, so we're talking about um, uh, almost two years ago on 2020 is when we began. And honestly, the biggest reason was, is uh, there's a couple of reasons really. One, um, I know this was later found in the research um, to maybe not 100% be the case, we don't know, but one of the things we were concerned about is the fact that you're not going to be able to come out and meet people. You're not gonna be able to come out of your house, which leaves a lot of time to be on your own. Um, and, and maybe even more important than that is it leaves a lot of time for an idle mind, um, a mind that's not able to be busy, my, you know, different things that you can come up with. And we did see this in some of the survey results that we were looking through initially that uh, some people in their comments were saying that, you know, because I didn't have anything else to do, um, I kind of turned to this, right? So I think a, there's a larger rooted issue there, but the, this was something we felt from the moment that COVID hit that this might spike. This might be something that will become an even bigger issue than it already is. The second real key issue there that we felt was that, and alhamdulillah, we work with all these Muslim youth, and alhamdulillah, they make such progress with us. They learn leadership skills. They get closer to their deen. They're studying things about Islam. Um, we've been working with organizations like Yakin on like how to kind of use their resources to help dispel doubts and things of this sort. But even if you do all of those things, pornography is such a personal, private sin for the most part that there, that nobody would ever know about, no matter like where you're at, whether you're far away from the mushrooms or you're going every day. Um, you might find, you know, that same issue can be everywhere. And so we felt that this is an issue that doesn't get talked about enough. It's actually, you know, it's avoided, right? And then a lot of uh, married couples, I'm like, I recently got married and I see that, I see it. I see the little stark difference where it's like, hey, there's so much shame, you know, with that concept. Um, and then all of a sudden it's good. Or all of a sudden, you know, it's something that you want to be doing right, or something that's encouraged. So one of the things that we felt like is because we don't educate our youth enough about proper understanding of this, proper knowledge of this, how to put Islam into perspective um, so that they don't turn to something like porn addiction, right? So this was the kind of the mindset that we had uh, coming in. Along the way, we found that this is a really big issue and we needed support from, you know, organizations that are far more qualified um, than us, so we felt that you know we have the numbers, we have the, the, the we're on the ground, we see the people. We need to work with organizations like FYI. We need to work with organizations like the Institute, like the Real Center, um, to really start addressing this. So that's where we're coming from. Um, we we felt that, especially because of the quarantine, that this is going to spike, um, and we felt mm -hmm. even if it doesn't, even if that's not the case, because it's such a private issue, because really like you may never be, you don't know who to turn to in this because there's so much shame associated with it that we have a responsibility to at least put our youth in the place where they can get resources to deal with it even if they never come to us and tell us there's a problem so i'm gonna I'll leave it off there inshallah but that's where we're coming from yeah jazakallah uh, khair actually uh, two things you made uh, two points you made that were really key is that um and it kind of goes to one of the findings is that um, I didn't get a chance to talk about it as much, which is that you could do all the right things, right? Um, it doesn't mean, it's not as simple as if I'm just Muslim enough, I won't do with this behavior. And so some of the findings we actually found was that there, again, this is preliminary because, you know, the findings don't go into like really deep behavior, but like, just because the findings show that there isn't a difference in the level of how practicing you are. Um, or how much you attend the masjid between those who uh, view pornography or don't view pornography. Again, that's just very preliminary, but it's basically showing that by itself, just because you attend the masjid doesn't, or, and, and then also, sorry, one more thing is that another finding was that they don't differ in terms of believing that pornography is immoral, right? Most of us think, oh, if I'm doing this negative behavior, it must mean because I think it's okay, that it's acceptable, right? So having a belief by itself is not enough to protect you from engaging in a negative behavior. We really have to dig into it more to really understand what, is it be, what does it mean about 
having a close relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does it mean about attending the masjid? What does it mean about being strong in your deen? That is what protects you. Right now, the findings don't, don't give us any information about that. But the idea is that because it's such a private sin um, and it's such a private act, you could be doing other things and that doesn't explain why you're not engaging in this behavior or why you are engaging in this behavior. Belief by itself isn't enough. You have to pair it with lots of other things. And that's what we need to more research to really better understand. Um, so I, I don't, uh, again, we, I could talk about this all day <laughs> and all night, but we do have Yakin on with uh, Sheikh Omar Hussein. So I'd like to pass it on to him, inshallah. Um, just again, with the interest of time, I'll just give you a very, very quick bio of Sheikh Omar Hussain. He uh, graduated from Al Hazar University with a degree in Islamic studies in Arabic. He is a licensed professional counselor associate, a licensed chemical dependency counselor. And um, he, I, I think this says he's currently a doctoral candidate, but I know since then he has completed his PhD, mashallah. Um, and I know also addictions um, are a particular specialty of his. So um, I'd love for uh, Sheikh Hussein, if you, Sheikh Omar, sorry, if you could sort of go into really the clinical side of it, right? Help us understand how does porn change the brain when it becomes an addiction? How does it change the brain? Um, how does shame feed the cycle? And what does a good treatment plan look like? What should people do who are looking for help? So for the record, I was here like 10 minutes before, but I took me like 25 minutes to get in. So alhamdulillah. Um, so let me just uh, touch briefly on how pornography addiction works. And then more importantly, maybe uh, three things that can help um, with, with those who are currently um, struggling with this. So first of all, if you look at the studies, it's very interesting. If you look at the brain of someone who watches a lot of porn and you look at the brain of other, a, a drug user, you notice a lot of similarities. And in the behavioral patterns, you will notice a lot of similarities. So uh, what does that mean? We will often find that uh, when someone starts, let's say drinking alcohol, they start with one beer and that gives them a buzz but after a little bit of time one isn't enough so they move to two so they move to three they move to four and they have to keep increasing because their tolerance of the smaller amount no longer is giving them that buzz now does every single person who drinks become addicted to alcohol no does every single person who watches pornography become addicted to pornography no and i'll talk about that in a second but when it we're talking about when things kind of get out of hand and we notice the same thing in those who watch pornography. Quite often, you'll start with something which may seem very, uh, maybe not that bad. Okay, so a scantily clad um, man or woman um, in, in, a, in a movie or something, right? And we under, this helps us understand why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Wala taqrabu zina, that don't approach unlawful sexual intercourse. When you open the door, then it's all open, okay? So it will start with something like that. And then maybe it'll move to what they call soft porn. And it, you'll know, you know, there'll be a progression to where this person will be involved in things and they would never have imagined yet just three or four months ago they could ever dream of watching something like this. Um, and they often feel disgusted with themselves. That how could I have gotten to this? And then, of course, there are those men that protect us all. They will go beyond now in terms of actually carrying out the act now. And this is not, none of this is, this isn't made up or fantasy. This is the reality of what can happen. So similar to the drug, you have a, a greater need for more, more and more hardcore, in this case, material uh, to get the same sort of hit. And then when someone tries to get off, depending on how much they've been addicted, we'll notice a lot of uh, those similar symptoms. So uh, there's, uh, when people withdraw from drugs, they, they will often have physical symptoms, um, very irritable. Um, they, they, they just lose their temper. People around them will be like, I can't recognize who they are, right? Because they need to get to their, whatever their drug of choice is. Um, and so often this will happen in pornography, that people, they'll, they'll be very irritable. They're, they're, they're just, they need to 
uh, it doesn't matter what the cost is, right? The problem comes in when that cost that is at the cost of your family. That's the cost of, of, of your spouse. When that's leading to hooking up with random people online, that is what this trajectory can lead to. So it's not a small thing. And we notice these similar patterns between a physical drug or what they call a process addiction. Now, just to help us understand, um, a, a, a process addiction we're all familiar with would be something like gambling, right? So it's similar to that. Someone puts in the token or whatever, and they just can't get themselves to stop. And then they, after they've spent $10,000, they wonder, how could I have done this? It's the same sort of a, a very similar cycle. So uh, this, the cycle repeats itself. And what makes it complicated with the religious person in general, and specifically the Muslims, is they, sell, they feel so much guilt and shame, and they just feel completely worthless. And they think, I'm a hypocrite. How can I be watching this? I was giving Jummah at the MSA last week. And no one is immune from this. The difference between this genre and, let's say, other drugs is nobody really says, wakes up one day and just walking in the street says, you know, I really want to smoke some weed. I really want to uh, smoke crack. Nobody really says that. You usually get into that because of a peer environment. You were at a party, you tried something. But with pornography, it's appealing to something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala naturally put in us, which is the attraction to the um, opposite gender. And it's not the act itself of intimacy. It's not dirty. It's not, uh, you know, it, but it is, it's something that Allah allowed us uh, gave us the ability to partake in, but only through the institution of marriage, because that is what's most conducive to a healthy society and a healthy family structure. So the problem with this is that it's appealing to something very natural to us. And that's why it can be dangerous. And then, of course, you have the accessibility. So we should be on guard for that. No one is immune to this. It, it, I mean, there's so many examples I can give of people you know, like you were saying, the involved in the community, religiously practicing. I found in my own research that religious commitment doesn't really make any difference when it comes to pornography, unfortunately. And I, I think a lot of that is not because people are a bunch of hypocrites, but because it's such, it's appealing to just something which is innately in us, uh, in a distorted sort of a version, of course. So it's important to understand what we're dealing with. Uh, the second point I want to make is just about the word addiction. So uh, addiction and, and people who are have a religious values, they often will say, I'm addicted, right? I'm addicted to pornography. And we use this term kind of loosely. So last night, when you knocked out that bag of Oreos, you're, are you now addicted to Oreos? Sure, you maybe had 10 or 11 more than you planned to have, but you're not addicted to Oreos. Now, if you're doing that every single night, for months on end, then maybe we would say you're addicted to Oreos. I haven't seen that as a diagnosis in any mental health manual yet. Um, but, you know, we'll just say, oh, I'm addicted, right? I'm addicted to my work. I'm addicted to this. I'm addicted to that. If you are watching, and I'm not, um, I'm not justifying even any watching because all of it ultimately uh, is, is, it destroys the soul. But if you're watching 20 minutes of porn a week, you're not addicted to pornography, Okay. It's a, it's a behavior, a negative behavior that needs to be changed, okay? The reason I mention that is because a lot of people become extremely hopeless right off the bat. Oh, I'm addicted, okay? Now, on the other hand, if you are watching five, six times a week for two and three hours and you're going to sleep late and you're, you're getting up and you're missing Fajr because you have to make ghusl, you're getting to work late, um, it's affecting your grades that's when we start talking about addiction. And addiction is basically something that has a major, it's causing a major impairment in our life, okay? So it's important to distinguish that because if it's more of a behavioral thing, inshallah, that is easier to work on than an addiction. And addiction is going to take uh, more effort. And that's very important to understand because a lot of people who are in that addiction phase think, I'll just knock it out myself. If you can, alhamdulillah. But in my experience, I've found incredibly, incredibly difficult to do that. So now when we go to the, the treatment, just wrapping up with this, 
the first point is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one we turn to for any struggle that we're having. It doesn't matter how great your therapist is. It doesn't matter how great the doctor is. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who tests and he is the one who will get us out of this calamity. So that is the first thing that must be emphasized when it comes to any of this, when it comes to um, activism, when it comes to anything in our, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is first and foremost and everything goes around that. The second is that um, having the support of a group is very, very important. That's actually the third point. Uh, the first was about what addiction and, and the behavior. But having group support, that is crucial. Um, I'm trying now to actually form like a, like a Muslim group, pornography anonymous type of thing. And it's been a struggle because people don't want to join. Um, even though they, they do need it. So slowly and surely, inshallah. But group support and talking about it and extending that to community members um, in a way to just say, look, you're not an evil person because you're struggling with this. Let's work together and let's try to, you know, get over this. Research shows us for people who maintain long-term sobriety from drugs, the, the, the support they have. Right, it's just so crucial. Um, I have worked with clients where the parents will catch the kid watching porn and, and confront the, the kid, right? And so you have your initial intake and the parents come with the kid. That's a beautiful thing for me to see that the kids feel enough support that their parents would join them. And the parents were not screaming at them and telling them you're going to hell and how could you do this? This isn't how we raised you. Saying we generally want him to get some help or her to get some help. That's why we're here. That support is going to go a long way versus the person who has to kind of, you know, sneak out um, just not knowing where to go for support. So group support is very important. And I hope inshallah, this is one of those efforts to lead to, to do that. Uh, Wallahu alam. Uh, Jazakallah khair, Dr. Omar. Um, I, I definitely think support, as you're saying, um, and kind of what Brother Anya mentioned before, is when, because it's a, an action that happens in such isolation, getting rid of that isolation factor is, you know, one of the biggest steps that you can take to recovery. Um, so Jazakallah khair for your thoughts, inshallah. And, um, you know, inshallah, everyone can come together to really support a struggle that is, you know, very stigmatized and it is, you know, on like the higher end of shame and wanting to share it with somebody and having the courage to share that you're struggling with it. Um, so uh, one of the last things I just want to conclude with, inshallah, and then we'll open it up for a question and answer is, uh, you know, so what can we do? There's lots of questions that are on here about how do I have this conversation? What can I do? This broke my marriage. You know, what, what are the resources that are out there? And so one of the goals of all of the organizations that are on here is really to provide those resources. So, you know, one of the things we did kind of in collaboration with Nasiha and using the um, findings from the Young Muslim Survey as well as community interviews is we created a toolkit. Um, and the toolkit is online, it's on our website, totally free of access, you know, free for you to access. Um, we have different sections on there. So if you yourself are struggling with pornography at any level, um, there are resources there. The goal of the toolkit really is to focus on addiction. So it's really for those people who are addicted, but the resources that are shared in there, um, I think could be beneficial to anyone, regardless of if it's just a behavior you're engaging in versus if it is an addiction that you are struggling with. Um, so there's resources for three kinds of categories. If you yourself are struggling with it, um, if you are a spouse of, you know, a, a partner that's struggling with it, um, whether you just found out, you don't know how to cope, you don't know what to do, or you have suspicions and you don't know what to do, um, or, you know, kind of just how do you move through it? How do you support your partner or, or, or not, right? So there's resources there. And then the third category is there are resources for parents. So I did see some questions on here popping up about if your teenager is struggling with it, what do you do? How do you have the conversation? Um, so there are resources for parents in terms of signs, what to look out for, how to provide support, how to have the conversation, what are next steps, all of that. So I really encourage everyone, we can't answer all the questions in the time that we have left, 
there's going to be questions we don't get to, but there are resources that you, you know, that you can get to on your own so that you don't have to, you know, until you find the courage to, or until a support group is launched, inshallah, there are resources there for you guys. Check out the toolkit. Um, it's pinned in the comments um, and it's there, inshallah. Please share it with everyone. Again, a resource is only helpful if we can get it to people who need it. So please share it in all your circles. Um, you know, inshallah, it's a good first, very, very first step, inshallah, to provide the resources. So I wanted to make sure we had time for question and answer. So let's get right into it, inshallah. Um, um, let's see. I'm going to go through some of the questions we have online and then some of the questions. And then um, Brother Danielle and Dr. Amral, I kind of shift them off to you guys, especially uh, questions that are not in my wheelhouse, inshallah. Um, so the first question I see here is, um, I, well, this one is, this one I, I think would be interesting is how do you recover as a female? So I think the question is generally just how do you recover as a female? But it's, um, I think it's really getting to the heart of if women are struggling with this, what are some resources or, um, specific treatment ideas that would be beneficial for them? Um, I think we'll we'll hand off that question to Dr. Omar. Um, but then I know young Muslims, you guys have your the women's wing as well. So if you have anything you'd like to chime in, please go for it. So that's a, you know a very broad question. I, I'm not sure the what the exact context is. Um, I think as you alluded to earlier, this problem uh, is it's found in. In, in women. Is it at the same level as men? No, um, but it's still there. In fact, the whole pornography industry has tried over the last five, 10 plus years to kind of market more towards women. Um, so because, I mean, we, we do tend to have a, a double standard uh, in our communities, in our Muslim communities, uh, that if, if women do something, it, it, it's seen as more shameful um, or it's treated more harshly. Um, which is problematic in, in many cases. And this is definitely one of those cases. Um, and this is why I think some sort of an anonymous support group uh, would be very beneficial um, for women who are struggling with this. Nowadays, a lot of things are online. Uh, you know, I'm even thinking something like change your name on the Zoom meeting and keep your camera off. Um, I think that's a huge first step. Uh, Many clients I have, they feel like, oh, no one, no one knows what I'm dealing with, when in fact there are many, and women will find the same thing. So some sort of an anonymous type of support group, I think, would be a major first step. Um, in terms of the, the treatment, what you have outlined in the, in the toolkit, or a lot of the techniques in like a one-on-one -on -one session, they would be similar. Uh, there wouldn't be a, a ton of difference necessarily. Um, but that first step, I think, is more, more challenging for the sisters in the community. So if we could have some sort of anonymous type of um, resources, um, hotline, something like that, that's what we should be thinking because, uh, because of kind of that double standard um, that, that does exist there. Sorry, I couldn't. I, I I couldn't tell if you were done. I went away for one second. Oh, okay. You finished. Okay. Yeah. All right. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, I think the the anonymous resources piece of it, I think, is what really has to be key, um, for sure. Um, and then I think understanding. I think we also just need more research, especially in the Muslim community, understanding does pornography look different um, in women, you know, versus um, uh, women. Inshallah. Um, the another another few questions I think were kind of around this topic that we're getting um, sort of has to do with what are steps that you can take um, bef uh, until you find the courage to get help. So this is more. This is both. So there's a question on here about what about if pornography is just the behavior you're struggling with, but it's not an addic addiction. What are some tips for that? Um, but then also, what are some steps that people can take until they have the courage to kind of share it um, and to reach out for support. Any ideas? 
Okay. Um, Either. <laughs> I, uh, go, go I, ahead. I want to be. I want to be careful <laughs> about answering any of these because this is one of the reasons why we went to the experts uh, to get advice as well. Um, we're coming from the perspective of we saw it in the youth, or now even when we saw it, we felt that this might be a need um, among the youth. But I think you know one thing I was mentioning at the beginning that I just wanted to reiterate is uh, there's a need for having these safe spaces. There's a need for having these places where you can go, even if it's not the place that you share it right away. Um, you know, even if it's not, you know, the place where you're just like, okay, we're going to deal with this addiction today at this group. Um, eventually, inshallah, you get there. Um, and I think great points are made about keeping it anonymous and things like that. Um, I will say from my experience working um, within uh, YM and, and these youth groups, I have had people who, you know, when they first came in, they were just, you know, uh, I guess the best word is uh, they were just they were just uh, spectators. You know, they were there. They were listening into the talk, listening into these types of stuff. Eventually, after a relationship was built to the point they they did even confide. Right. Um, in, in someone like myself, I guess, you know, someone who we we built a relationship for a while and they felt comfortable enough to at least say, hey, I need the help. Right. And then pointing him to the right resources. Alhamdulillah. So it's not I don't I don't have numbers about about that, about percentages, but from personal experience, I've seen that the benefits of that, but also more than that, I think, uh, like I was saying before about the idle mind of having like nothing else to do. You're not really hanging out with anybody. You're just staying, you know, at home and then your laptop's right there, your phone's right there and no one's around, you know, that, that, that could, one thing could lead to another, I guess you could say. And, and the more that not so much, Oh, like you need to be around like, uh, a spirituality or you need to be around this, all of that is great. But I think just the fact that you're with people, and you're doing things, and you're, you're active, and you're keeping your mind active. And I believe this was one of the things that we were kind of taught um, in the training that we did uh, with the Khalil Center and Yakin Institute to, to keep yourself active, keep yourself like, with other people, um, at least in the first steps we're talking about here. I'm not talking about, you know, dealing with it completely and addiction is a whole other thing. I understand that. Um, but that's something that we feel like at, at YM we can really provide uh, because we've been doing this for like decades now and we have brothers groups, we have sisters groups um, and you can find us, you know, on our websites and, and there, we're pretty much, you know, in most major cities um, over the country. Um, and then another step beyond that is we're working actually with Yakin right now um, in the center to set up trainings for our leadership so that they're equipped to even lead a discussion on something like this and potentially get it to the person who they may not bring it up in that talk, but they got what they needed. Um, and they got the toolkit they needed, and then they're going to consult the people they need to consult. But that's just steps um, that I think, you know, initial steps that I think we can help with. But in terms of, you know, the, the uh, I guess the best steps to take to really remove the problem, I'm going to defer uh, to my teachers, my experts I'm learning as well. I think one of the things that we talk about in the toolkit is that, until you can find the courage, you know, to reach out for help. Again, that has to be like really ultimately the, the big step. But until you do, um, maybe thinking about, you know, what are doing some like internal self reflection, right? So what are the reasons that you personally watch in porn, right? Like you mentioned already, uh, Brother Danielle about like, oh, it's, is it because you're bored, right? So you're trying to like, occupy your mind. Again, some of the findings show that it's maybe for some people it's to process some, something negative right something bad happens in your life that's your trigger so like really trying to do some reflection to understand what your triggers are again being careful with that because if for some people you know clinically it, it is really important to be careful with it especially if there is a situation of you know like abuse or past trauma that is difficult to uncover you have to you know tread that very very carefully uh, you know but just doing some general introspection to understand what are the reasons what are some of the triggers paying attention to like, if you do, you know, we had some questions in here about, I tried to stop and I couldn't, I, you know, was in a relationship and that's what, but then I keep going back to it. So like understanding when you do go back to it, what are some of those behaviors that are associated with you kind of going back to it? So maybe you could spend some time thinking a little bit there, um, you know, as you try to sort of build up some of that courage to really get help. Dr. Omar, did you want to add anything? Yeah, I'll just, uh, those are all great points. Uh, something which might work uh, is just a basic behavior modification. So uh, if it's a, it's a behavior and it's not a, a kind of a full-blown addiction, 
basically you you set a consequence and reward for when you watch so for and this is based off the wisdom of the prophet sallallahu who said uh, to follow a sin with a good deed it wipes it away um, instead of feeling uh, drowning ourselves in shame and feeling guilty and how terrible we are it's kind of like okay we can't go back and change it we make tawbah and we move forward so you set up something so that um, if you are to watch it there's a penalty that you have to pay so for example uh, the next time I'm going to watch pornography uh, I'm going to donate $20 to, I don't know, the masjid or whatever, okay? And that might be enough to deter, because again, we're talking about not a intense, hard-blown sort of uh, addiction. Now, if someone says, well, I don't have money, okay, well then fast, okay? So that way, so you're either going to go broke or you're going to starve, okay? So one of the two should work. Um, but people have found success with this because kind of, I just kind of needed that something because Especially, you know, you have a, uh, we're all just trying to improve our connection with Allah. If that connection is there and you say that I am going to fast three days consecutively if I watch pornography this Friday night because I'm always watching it Friday night and, you know, at around 10 o'clock, that's, that's the only time I watch. Then, inshallah, that will help you to kind of reprogram uh, your brain to not want to watch it. And you'll start to see that, yeah, I, I don't really need it. So that might be something you can try, um, you know, even after done watching this, um, if, if it's just kind of a, a little bit of a behavioral issue. That's great. That's a great point. Um, and, you know, Shelly, you can find more resources online to figure out, like, learning more about behavior modification um, and other steps that you might take kind of on your own before you find the courage to get help. Um, one of the other questions I think that we're getting a lot, both on the live as well as on the Google survey, and we're trying to get through these questions, so just be patient with us, um, is has to do about like exposing sin, right? So if you do reach out to someone for support, whether it's a professional or a support group or a friend, is that exposing your sin? Um, and, you know, uh, what's the issue tied to that? So I think that's a little bit more of a you know, like a religious question than a psychological question. Um, so I don't know, Brother Dion, if you want to take it, but I think that might be more Dr. Omar's wheelhouse. I think she got it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Go for it. There's a difference between openly sharing a sin, not being remorseful about it, or even bragging about it. There's another thing to genuinely want to get out of something that you're just not able to get get out of. And I don't see any connection with that and just going and talking about all the sins we commit. So if someone really has issues with pornography and they've had it for years and they just can't get out, they always try and then they fail and then they go for help because they can't do it themselves. I don't see that as any different than someone going to a medical doctor if they have some issue, right? You can't just kind of, some things you just can't over, uh, over, overcome them by yourself. So I don't see that as exposing sin. I see that as genuinely trying to get out of a sin. Um, that's different than just sitting with a bunch of friends and, hey, I was with this person last night and doing this. Some of the conversations were, were around, but uh, that's, I don't see that as the same way, the same thing as, as genuinely getting help because if you don't do that, the behavior will continue and it would just be more and more time of being involved in this. And so I don't, I don't really see that. I, I don't see the, um, the common ground there. I think it's just someone genuinely looking for help out of something. And you're going to go to people that can really help you. So when you're struggling, what do you go to? You go to your BFF, uh, maybe you go to the Imam, right? You go to your local youth leader. Those are people who they can, inshallah, give some guidance to do that. I, I just, I don't see that as exposing sin. I think that's just a shaitan's trick to just keep us involved and, and keeping us continually uh, watching it. Yeah. And I think it has to do with, I think, the general stigma we have in our community with therapy and trying to get help is, oh, if I go to therapy and I talk about you know, the trauma I have from this experience with this person, or, 
you know, I'm, I'm backbiting or I'm gossiping. Um, and the idea is exposing sin or sharing sin like you shared. It's not about it, that concept is more about boasting, right? Like posting thick pictures on Facebook about you engaging in some kind of, you know, sinful behavior. That's not what we're talking about. This is in a therapy session and you reveal what you're struggling with or like you're saying with a best friend. That's the Nia behind it is different um, and the process there is different. Um, so I think this question of sharing, you know, exposing your sin and not protecting your bad deeds applies to all kind of mental health concerns and mental illnesses that people struggle with and seeking therapy. And it's just, as you said, it's just not true. Yeah. And, and just, you know, you, 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 because you, you've mentioned a few times now the, the stigma, it's like, there's like extra stigma. If I'm struggling to make my prayer and I'm going and asking someone, you know, I'm, I'm not consistent in the prayers. I mean, when you're not, when you don't pray, you're committing a sin. Is that exposing a sin? No, it's saying, help me help myself so I can pray consistently. Right. Or I can be more focused. In it. So it's just, it's just kind of, we can't like elevate things as we choose, right? Mm -hmm. It's the same principle of I need help with something and I'm, I'm coming to someone I trust. It's not some, um, you know, just someone I don't trust. I, I don't, I don't see any, any common ground there. Wallahu a'ala. Right. Um, I think we have time for just one more question, inshallah. Um, and so, and I'm thinking through some of the different questions we've got and kind of what's the main question we see here. Um, one of the common questions that we're getting is, um, how do you how do you heal from what watching pornography does to you? So, um, the question is more about not like not what's a treatment plan, but the what it does to your heart, what it does to your soul, what it does to your relationships. How do you kind of heal from that over time? Uh, so that, again, a, a big, big question. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you know, th the longer we're able to abstain, the less it will impact us. Um, the person who has been sober from alcohol for twenty years is different than the what first month that they were sober. So initially, it's gonna, you know, though there might be challenges, there might be relapses, but the longer we can get away from it. Uh, the more it will kind of fade, and uh, that 's really what we're we're we 're trying to get to so th there 's no substitute for time and again, depending on the frequency and everything that that we 've been consuming it it 's going it 's going mag it 's going to be that much uh, take that much longer um, but you know again with time um, and working through it, then inshallah it will just become something which does not have the same uh, amount of impact and you will be able to walk i mean sexual images are all over our society um but you'll be able to walk and it, it won't really cross your mind right because you you've you've kind of moved past that and it's not how you view the world anymore it's just a changing of a focus a great example one clinician gave was um, if you're on a roller coaster and you're sitting next to he said he was a man, so he said, beautiful woman, right? And you can look or whatever you want. When you get to the peak, you won't notice her anymore because you're just like, oh my God, we're going to drop, right? The focus is totally shifted. So that's, that's what happens um, as, as you move with, with time and with effort and working through it. Uh, then you, you, you don't see the world like through like that, like pornified lens, you know, where uh, again, generally men, but women also with, you know, the, the other, the other opposite sex, like just doesn't have any dignity or it's just about um, serving your carnal pleasures. So um, that, that it, it's a process, I guess is the best way to answer that question. It's a process, again, depending on how much damage has been done previously. Right. And it, that is a big question. It, it is hard to answer. I think we could have a whole hour on that question for sure. Um, and I think it, again, it also depends on, like you're saying, the damage that is done. If you're in a relationship, the impact on your partner, um, you know, if it's parent versus child. So it's, it's complicated and it's hard to kind of give a, a broad stroke answer to that. Um, it is eight o'clock. So I just, I want to show everybody, I personally am okay with staying on and answering a few more questions, but I just want to give everyone a quick, um, I, we're getting some questions about the toolkit. So I just want to 
if I can do it here. Um, just want to show everybody what the toolkit looks like online. So if you just go to the FYI.org, we have um, a toolkits page. Can you guys see that or am I turning the camera? I'm probably turning the camera. Um, so if you just scroll down there, you can get to the porn addiction toolkit right here. Um, and then, like I said, it has all the different sections on here, depending on where I'll scroll down to show you that, depending on who you are, right? So if you are personally in, you know, struggling with this problem, go to that tab, and it'll take you to an entire toolkit with resources, if you're a spouse or if you're a parent. Um, and so I know we didn't get to a lot of questions today, but um, a lot of them, inshallah, can be answered with some of the resources found in the toolkit, inshallah. So I, it is eight o'clock. I do want to respect everybody's time. I'm okay staying on to answer a few more questions. Um, Dr. Omar and Brother Danielle, I wanted to thank you guys for taking time out on an evening um, to just be on here to talk about a topic that I think a lot of people need support with. So Jazakallah khair. May Allah make this heavy on your scales. Um, and inshallah, I would love for all of our organizations to come together and provide a lot of the resources that people are looking for. Jazakallah khair. Um, and you guys are welcome to stay on if you want to stay on for more question and answer, but um, everyone's got lives <laughs> and, and families to get to. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to head out. Okay. Just after yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm going to have to jump off as well, but um, <clears throat> I left some links as well, inshallah, if anybody's interested. Um, and joining, and inshallah, we'll be having trainings um, with um, FYI and with Yaqeen Institute. But Jazakallah khair, everybody. Jazakallah khair for all that you're doing. Assalamualaikum. Jazakallah khair, Assalamualaikum. Um, so I think some of the other questions on here, I think we, one of the main ones we're getting is just how do you kind of take your relationship with Allah <clears throat> and use that to turn it into a real feeling? Um, and if that's really the main solution, um, and I just wanted to highlight from this question that, as I said in the beginning, in terms of what the data are showing us, that having a belief that something is wrong is not enough, right? That's not the only thing that protects you from engaging in a behavior that at its core is happening for lots of other reasons. Um, and so you really, that can be your beacon of hope. Um, you can, you know, always turn to Allah's mercy and always turn to his hope. Um, to help you through each time, especially when you relapse and especially when you, you know, have felt like you stopped the behavior for a while and then you're back into it. Always turn to his hope. It is always there for you. But you have to pair that with other strategies and other solutions that we talked about already on this call, which is uh, on this live, sorry, which is, you know, doing some introspection, understanding what are your triggers, building a support group around you. Find an accountability partner who can hold you accountable for the plan that you have. And then ultimately, ultimately, especially if you are somebody that this is an addiction for you, um, beyond just the behavior you're engaging in, you really have to get um, support from a mental health professional. You have to get a treatment plan in place, inshallah. Um, so all those things coming together, that's really can what what's, can provide you support and help you through this struggle um, on your journey to recovery so that you then can really have that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, and in a way that makes you feel happy and good and feel like you have um, a pure heart, um, you know, through your time in that journey. So I just wanted to make sure I address that question. Um, I think we will wrap up inshallah. As I mentioned before, the toolkit is online. It's pinned there. It's a resource that really will answer a lot of the questions that you've talked about. The data we've shared today from young Muslims um, that the FYI analyzed, it's a very preliminary look. Um, you also can find more information about that data um, on our website. It's a very, very quick, again, I mentioned a brief snapshot into what's really going on. Inshallah, we have an upcoming um, research study um, that really will help us dig into it more. If you're interested in participating, you can also sign up on our website. Again, we of course will protect um, anonymity and confidentiality. And then finally, we are digging into the data a little bit more to really talk about um, some, you know, what are those who use 
uh, consume pornography a lot, you know, kind of how do they differ from those who don't, um, what's protective, um, and what are some of the gender differences that are there in terms of women using it um, and males. So we'll be digging into that into an upcoming um, uh, report, um, and that'll be shared on our website as well. So stay tuned for that, inshallah. Um, Jazakallah khair. Um, inshallah, inshallah, with the support and resources we all are sharing, we can provide some support. Sorry, I think I got cut off. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Have a good night.